Yakshatravando Paribhuya Surya Prashashti Drishta Stadayam Hidandya Prashashti Drishta Stadayam Hidandya Esha Manudhye Yapadapta Yukmam Esha Manudhye Yapadapta Yukmam Jagat Guru Mangala Mangalam Swayam Jagat Guru Mangala Mangalam Swayam Yakshatravando Yashatra Bandhu Paribhuya Suri Prashashti Drishta Stadayam Hidandya Prashashti Drishta Stadayam Hidandya And 
Therefore, Chitraketu Chitra must be punished. Must be punished. Please hear the Lord God. All the members of the assembly were exalted Brahmanas and self-realized souls. But they did not say anything about the conduct of Lord Shiva, who was embracing the goddess Parvati on his lap. Chitraketu nonetheless criticized Lord Shiva. And therefore, the opinion of Parvati was that he should be punished. Om Agnana Dhimirangasya Jnana Janashalakaya Chakshurun Mirita Yena Tasmai Shri Guru Vedama Sri Chaitanya Mano Abhishtam Stapita Yena Bhutale Sukhya Rupa Kathamayam Vidati Swapadantikam Mandeham Shri Guru Shri Uttapadakamalam Shri Guru Vaishnam Namascha Shri Rupam Sakrajatam Sahagana Ragunakam Vitantam Sajivam Sarvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Pada Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakan Vitam Sya He Krishna Karna Sivyo Dina Mando Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Anamostate Tapta Khan Chana Gorange Radhe Vrinda Vanishwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priya Namo Mahabad Nyaya Krishna Prema Pradayate Krishna Ay Krishna Chaitanya Namni Gaurit Vishena Maha Vancha Kalpatru Vyascha Kripa Sinuya Evacha Patitana Bhavane Pyo Vaishnavi Pyo Jaya Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasadi Gaurav Pranda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare So in the last two verses, which Enopa quotes, followed up by this verse, text 13, we find that Parvati Mata is actually now justifying and giving reasons why Chitraketu Maharaj's actions are not right. And she is very upset because she calls him with very strong language. In this particular verse, Chitraketu Maharaj is no not a Kshatriya but he is known as Kshatriya Bandhu. When you have the word Bandhu in Sanskrit together with Kshatriya, it means that you are only Kshatriya because maybe you were born into the family of Kshatriya. Just like Ashwatthama in the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam was described as Brahmana Bandhu. He was not considered Brahmana. So in Sanskrit, Prabhupada writes in Bhagavatam when the word Bandhu is used, that means there is only family relation, but there is no qualification in terms of character. This is an important point for us because we must actually assume whatever um, qualification that we have, not in terms of what we are born into or not in terms of what we are wearing, but in terms of our behavior. Behavior is essential for Vaishnava. There is no point calling ourselves devotees if our behavior does not show us devotees. We may have tila, we may have dhoti, we may have kurta. But if our consciousness is not devotional, then it becomes external. So, this point of Shatriya Bhattu should be understood in the correct context. And Parvati Mata is actually giving a good indication that for Vaishnava, what is more important is character. Finally, Srila Prabhupada is glorified in the three worlds because he is defined by his purity of character. And that no one can take away from the Vaishnava. Which is why the ornament of a Vaishnava <coughs> is actually his character. So Chitraketu Maharaj's criticizing of Lord Shiva did not sit very well with Parvati for the reasons we have discussed before and mostly because she believes sincerely that Lord Shiva is a personality so great that by Sastra we have no right to actually even judge him or even try to compartmentalize him into a particular characterization. So the word she uses is very strong she says that uh, Chitraketu Maharaj is not only the lowest of Shatriya, but 
language. He also says he has been very impudent. And why has he been impudent? Because she says, look at the assembly of personalities who were seated. And now we understand that not only was Narada, because Narada we mentioned a few verses below, but we find that now she is even quoting and she is even stating the great personalities like Brahma, the great personalities like uh, um, just before that, Manu, Manu. Kapila, Sarat Kumaras, and the four Kumaras, Brihu, they were all part of the assembly. So this is astonishing. And she has a very good argument because she is saying that, are we really saying that these personalities are also blind? Will they have condoned such actions if they did not see it in the right light? So this is the question she's asking. And Prabhupada makes it a point in the purport to remind us that everyone who was seated there were exalted brahmanas and they were self-realized souls. But they did not say anything about the conduct of Lord Shiva. So that is why Parvati is asking, who has given him the authority to behave in this manner? Lord Shiva is personified religion. Why? Because Lord Shiva is always meditating on the lotus feet of Krishna. That is why he is considered to be the spiritual master of the entire world. Because he leads by example. And the best example that Lord Shiva has given us in this chapter is the very fact that he did not counteract the curse. Or rather, he did not counteract the strong statement and criticism of Chitra He did not. He was silent, he was smiling, and he was simple. That was all he did. So, based on all this, Bhagavati concluded that Chitra Ketu deserves to be punished. And this is very important. Why? Because when a personality tries to criticize a great personality, then if that great personality is a Vaishnava, then it is considered to be Vaishnava Aparat. And Vaishnava Aparat, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has warned us, <coughs> is like a mad elephant. If you put a mad elephant in a, in a porcelain shop with vases and chinaware and things which are very fragile, you are bound to have complete destruction. And in the same way, when we start to actually criticize Vaishnavas, we may not openly, even with our mouths, say something, but in our hearts, Krishna is Paramatma. So we cannot hide the fact that we may be offensive even without speaking. This is a very dangerous thing. How are we to understand then the workings of the Vaishnava? Because sometimes that which is beyond our understanding, we tend to criticize. Very often criticism comes because of lack of understanding. And very often it comes because of ignorance. But very quickly, if we continue this habit, this lack of understanding and ignorance will slowly turn to pride. And when that happens, our heart becomes dirty. Chitrugetu Maharaj Prabhupada writes in this episode did not actually mean to insult Lord Shiva. But Prabhupada also says it was not right for him to criticize either. Why? Because when Vaishnavas have discrepancies, or if in relating with Vaishnavas there are discrepancies, these discrepancies should be overlooked. In the eighth canto, uh, there is the episode of Vamandev. You all remember Vamandev? The Lord comes as a dwarf and he asks for three steps and in that way he conquers Bali Maharaj. Bali Maharaj had a spiritual master. His name was Sukracharya. Sukracharya was not actually a spiritual master in the sense of being a devotee of the Lord. He was more a spiritual master based on seminal relationship, family spiritual master. And when Bali Maharaj decided to give whatever Vamandev um, had wanted the request of three pieces of land judged by his feet. Sukracharya snapped a rat and immediately he told Bali, my dear Bali, do not give in to this personality. I think there is more than meets the eye. But Bali Maharaj disobeyed the orders of Sukracharya. But he did so not on grounds of being offensive. He did so on grounds of the fact that this spiritual master was actually stopping him from serving the greatest personality in the world, and that is Vamadev. So Bali Maharaj was right, but after he did that, Sukracharya became very offensive to Bali 
and he cursed him. And he said that because you have um, disobeyed me, you will lose all your riches. A Prabhupada writes in the purport, that curse for Vaishnava is a blessing. When someone comes and tells you, whatever you have goes, and you are a devotee, you should say Hari Bol. Because if you have that with you, that which is material will always be disturbing. So Bali Maharaj was born in a family of demons, but his consciousness was there for Vaishnava. So he took that curse, he took that criticism in the right way, and he continued. Now, after Bali was finally conquered, so to speak, by Ramadev, and he had only one last step to take, and there was no other place left, what does Bali Maharaj say? He says, let the last step be on my head, because I could not discharge what I had honored and promised. And because it is my fault that you are not able to fulfill what I had given you. So please take my head, and I am surrendered to you. And at that point, Mahamadev becomes very, very pleased with Bali Maharaj. Prahlad Maharaj, who is Bali Maharaj's great-grandfather, he comes and he, he, he pleads to give mercy. Brahmaji comes, he pleads to give mercy. Bali's wife, she pleads for mercy. And finally, the Lord, who is the embodiment of mercy, he gives Bali all the great benediction of a devotee. Devotional service plus untold material opulence. And at the end of it, the Lord turns to Sukracharya and he says, Sukracharya, what do you think of this episode? Do you think now that Bali is still wrong? Do you think that what he did was wrong? The Lord is asking that question. And at that point of time, Sukracharya says a very important point for us to understand in relation to this verse. He says, Mantratas Tantratas Chitra. He says, My dear Lord, there may be discrepancies when devotees chant or pronounce mantras. There may sometimes be discrepancies when devotees try to perform some principle but not according to regulated principle. Then he says, Desha, desha Kalartha Vastutaha. There may be discrepancies when devotees perform an activity according to time, place, circumstances, and even Vastu, directions. And then he says, Sarva Karoti Mis Chidra. Chidra in Sanskrit means discrepancy, mistake. Some discrepancy the Lord Shiva did, for example. But Ni and Chidra, if you put them together, becomes no discrepancy, Mis Chidra. Then he says, very nice point. He says, Sarva Karoti Mis Chidra. And when he says, Sarva Karoti Mis Chidra, he then says, Anu Tavasam Kirtana. He says, but my dear Lord, even though a great personality may have so many discrepancies, the moment your Lordship's names are chanted, there are no discrepancies. This is a very important verse for us to keep in heart. Because when we live with devotees, the eyes, the senses, they are always prone at some point to find the fault. We always, the mind is trained in this material world to look for discrepancies. We say, hey, he's supposed to behave this way, he's not. And we start judging. Oh, he's supposed to speak this way, but he's not. And we start judging. And before we know it, we have become imputed. And before we know it, we have become offensive. So as devotees, we must remember this very important instruction from Bhagavad There may be discrepancies in many things. But as long as that devotee is chanting your Lordship's names, we should take it that there are no discrepancies. This was also how Mahaprabhu treated all his devotees. Even the first class offender who came to Mahaprabhu, we said Hare Krishna even once. Mahaprabhu's instructions to us was, he is defined as a Vaishnava because he has chanted Hare Krishna. So if a Vaishnava says Hare Krishna and he is Vaishnava, then who are we to judge him? This is the point Parvati Mahaprabhu is putting forward. And this is the point that the exalted members of the assembly also felt. And that is why Parvati Mata said that by principle, Chitra Ketu must be punished. Lord Shiva did not feel it because a Vaishnava is humble. If someone offends him, he says, it's all right. He may be right. But those who are servants or those who are serving the Vaishnavas, it becomes our responsibility to look into the matter. Or if we can't, to bring it up to the proper authority. Because our way is the way of 
parampara. We should not short circuit the process and become heroes. And in doing so, we cause more offenses. That is also spiritual immaturity. And this point of punishment is very important. The word that is used by Prabhupada is dandya. Dandya means to be punished. And in the same similar situation, for in the fourth canto, Lord Brahma comes to Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva had just punished Daksha. Because Daksha, if you remember, had actually criticized him so much, but he let him go. But when Parvati, in the form of Sati, went over to her father's fire sacrifice, and she saw that he was continually, continuously offending Lord Shiva by ignoring him, then she felt that I have nothing to do with this father. And since this body has come from his blood, better I give it up. And she just burnt herself with the power of austerities. And at that point, Lord Shiva decided, I must punish because this man has become impudent. Great personalities may be able to dish out punishment, Prabhupada writes, but it may not be possible for us. So when Lord Shiva then decides that he will send his servants, they raid the fireplace, they turn the fire sacrifice upside down, and then Virabhadra, who is coming from the hair of Lord Shiva, he takes the head of Daksha, and putting him in the southern part of the sacrifice, he chops his head off. And having done that, they all come back to see Lord Shiva. <coughs> the fire sacrifice is incomplete. Brahmaji and the Devatas, they are all bewildered. What should we do? So Brahma, together with all the Devatas, they go and see Lord Shiva in Kailash. And while he's sitting in the grove, we find that Lord Shiva is very calm. And when he's approached by Lord Brahma, Lord Shiva says that I had to perform this action as a form of punishment because this personality had gone too far and in my capacity I am trying to correct him for his purification. This is also practical for us. When we have other devotees pointing out our mistakes, we should not tell them don't become like Chitra Ketu and point out mistakes to me. If we do that, we are misusing Bhagavad. From Vaishnava's point of view, if someone points out a fault of ours, we should with folded hands say, thank you very much. I think I should look at this, or maybe I should explain to you what was in my mind. And you please guide me if I was wrong. The moment we do that, we come out of the material energy and we come under the shelter of the Lord's spiritual energy. If we think I am right, and I'll tell you why I am right, then we continue to remain under the material energy of the Lord. And the nature of the material energy of the Lord is that it will always cause us disturbance. The nature of the spiritual energy of the Lord is that it brings us peace. So if someone objectively points out a fault of yours and we accept it full-heartedly, the test in your heart is, after that, will I still be peaceful and charmed and do my services? Or do I become disturbed because my ego has been bruised? This is a useful litmus test for us as practicing devotees. Now, Brahmaji says, after meeting Lord Shiva, and Lord Shiva speaks all these points, Brahma then brings up a very, very important principle that we just described here. He says, the verse is 4th canto, 6th chapter, 47th verse. 4, 6, 47. And in this verse, Lord Brahma says, Pritadhyaya karma drisho durashaya Paro dae na rupita hip rujo anisham. Paranduruktae vidudanti arutudas. Tamma vadidae.